taking off and we're hopefully going to just continue on with that for years and years. Um, I would now like to present uh, Kristen Shelton. She is a, a respiratory therapist at Stanford. She's been a respiratory therapist for over 30 years. She's well known to many families living with CF and has witnessed firsthand the many advances in CF care and quality of life. Please help me welcome Kristen Shelton, who is here to review your CF tools of the trade. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. And thank you for inviting me to speak. What an honor to be invited. So we've had a lot of um, people already talk today about infection and inflammation and mucus. And I'm going to carry on with that. So some of my slides are um, repeating what, pe what people already said today. So I hope that I can kind of ad lib and make things more helpful to you so that we can spend more time discussing things that are more pertinent to your lives. So I encourage you to pick my brain and please ask anything that you can think of that will help you in your everyday lives. So today my plan is to discuss treating and preventing lung infections what causes trapped mucus, removing trapped mucus from the lungs and airways, what effective coughing means, how to clean and care for your airway clearance equipment, and sustaining effective airway clearance when you're away from home. So one of the first things I want to talk about is that I hope that I see, I know a lot of you because you come to our CF Center. I think that's wonderful and I'm very excited about that. But I also want to say that no matter where you go for your CF care, you have to form a relationship with your CF team. It's a collaboration. It's about talking about what your feelings are and, and uh, what your child's feelings are and working out a plan with your physician that works for your family. It has to be a negotiated thing. It's not all one way or the other. And uh, I think we, it's hard for us to remember that sometimes, but we try. So the three major causes of lung problems, as you've heard today, are the, when the airways become obstructed and blocked with thick, sticky mucus. When there's uh, mucus in the lungs that become uh, infected and the fact that those infections cause inflammation and damage that is often irreversible. So this is a schematic of the vicious cycle. I like to call it the vicious cycle of lung damage. We've talked about it a lot today. Um, you guys can look at that. I'm not going to go over it again because it's been talked about a lot. Do you have any questions about what causes what? So this is a CF airway compared to what a normal airway looks like. And you can see that the airway is kind of enlarged because there's a lot going on in there. There's uh, swelling, mucus, and sometimes the blood. The blood can be very scary. This shows a picture of a normal lung and then a lung with bronchiectasis. We talked about bronchiectasis a lot today too. and. I, uh, I want to show you how to prevent bronchiectasis. That's my goal today. So we're going to talk about some everyday treatments for better living with CF. Those treatments include medications that we're going to inhale, airway clearance to help get the mucus out, and aerobic exercise. So a lot of times when we have uh, kids that have 
viral illnesses. They'll start to have more symptoms of their CF. And it'll be kind of a tough call because the parents will wonder, is this something where I should go into the CF center and see my CF doctor? Should I call the nurse? Should I go to the pediatrician? What should I do? And one of the first things you need to do when you're seeing increased symptoms is to increase the uh, airway clearance. And a lot of parents forget that. It's ha really hard to do two treatments a day. <laughs> and that's what we always ask parents to do. But to increase it to three or four treatments a day is a really big burden. But it's often very important for getting through that period where the uh, virus is attacking the lungs. Whether it's the CF or the virus that's causing the problem, it's the symptoms that we need to look at and control. So these are some of the things that you'll see when there's an increased need for airway clearances. Uh, coughing more than usual, more mucus than usual, or a change in the color or thickness of the mucus. And sometimes that can be really hard to, to uh, tell in kids because they aren't very good about showing you what the mucus looks like. So you have to do your best to figure it out. So I'm going to show you the medications in the order that we do the delivery in. And this is negotiable, but I'm going to try and explain why we do it this way and why we ask families to do it this way. If you have any questions or you do it differently, um, you can tell us why you do that, and that sounds great. We'll talk about it. So the first thing we do is we put medications in the lungs to help open the airways up. And the reason for that is because you want to find a way to get the mucus out of your ear. So if you can get the, open, the airways to open up any more, then the mucus can flow easier and you'll feel better. So that's why we use bronchodilators. Not everybody with CF responds to them, but we tend to use them universally. And that's, not, that's our center, not all centers do that, but that's pretty much what we do at our CF center. So albuterol is open X. Duoneb, those are examples of what the bronchodilators are called. Hydrators, like hypertonic saline, help to get the mucus off the sides of the airways so that it can come out. They um, make the mucus more slimy so it can move, a little more thin. <coughs> Um, and the hypertonic saline also does tend to cause more coughing, so the coughing helps to get the mucus moving too, so it kind of serves multiple purposes. Mucus alteration is done with mucomist or pulmozyme. Uh, pulmozyme has been around for probably the last 20 years and actually breaks up the DNA in the mucus. We know there's a lot of DNA because mucus contains a lot of byproducts from cells breaking down, so the, the pulmozyme helps to break that up. And the mucomist helps to thin the mucus out also. Uh, we have used mucomist a lot more recently than we, it's, it's a very old medication, it's been around for a very long time. And it does tend to be kind of hard to handle sometimes because it smells like rotten eggs. And the kids don't like it very much. So I, I think that's something that needs to be negotiated. We aren't trying to torture people. We want them to do things that help them. So airway clearance is not a medication, but this is the order that airway clearance fits in, because you've put these medications in and now you want to get the mucus out. If you're doing a vest, the vest is done concurrently with these medications. After you've gotten as much mucus as you can out of the lungs, this is the time that you're going to put inhaled antibiotics in. These are a lot of the common inhaled antibiotics that uh, are used in CF. And the idea with inhaling the antibiotics is actually delivering the killing power directly to the source. Like uh, Dr. Wine said, you want to get the antibiotics in there where they can get at the bacteria and not at the other organs, so it's a very direct source of killing off the problem bugs. And then last but not least are inhaled steroids, and um, Dr. Moss said that these are sometimes used, sometimes not. These go last after everything else. It includes uh, Flovent, Pomacort, 
Simbacort, Qvar, uh, all of these are examples of the inhaled steroids that we might be using. Sure. Is there a difference between um, inhaling the mucomist versus uh, oral mucomist in terms of it being a mucolytic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, inhaled mucomist works as a mucolytic. When you, when you swallow muco, mucomist, it works more as an antioxidant. So it doesn't work on the mucus. Well, it might work on the mucus that it touches in the GI tract, because there is a lot of mucus in there too. But it wouldn't work on the lung mucus if you're swallowing it. That's a complicated question, though. You better ask your doctor. Because <laughs> maybe there are ways that the antioxidants help in the long run, but that's... <laughs> we'll get Dr. Moss back up. You gave a great so this PARI LC Plus nebulizer is kind of the Cadillac or the Mercedes of nebulizers. And I like to use it for CF because you can really use it to nebulize just about anything except for casein. It is very efficient. It makes good particle size. It, uh, it works well because it doesn't waste a lot of medication. And it's very durable and it can be boiled. And it needs to be replaced about every six months. But I'm wondering about the ones where you don't waste the medicine, where you, where you breathe in. They look like that, but you breathe in and they only um, work when you're breathing in. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Breath actuated nebulizers? Yes, thank you. Yes, that's those are good too. Uh, they aren't really cleared to use for antibiotics. Okay. But people do use them for that. For saline and dornase? Or? Yes. And are they better? Better than this? Uh huh. Probably comparable. This is a nebulizer that was um, introduced because it was fast. And the reason it's fast is because it wastes a lot of medication. <laughs> so some medications that you inhale are not really that dose dependent. Albuterol or Zopinex is a good example of that. It works well even if you don't get the entire dose. Pulmozyme also works well if you don't get the entire dose. And that's why the company that makes Pulmozyme brought these nebulizers out. It's because it's a faster way to get the medication. So it helps with adherence and it helps to decrease the treatment burden because in about five minutes you can nebulize your albuterol or your pomazon. Now if you're doing an antibiotic in here, you're gonna waste most of the antibiotic out through that hole near the mouthpiece. So it's not a good way to do the antibiotic because you want the antibiotic to go into the lungs where every single part of it can touch the bacteria that's in there. It's very dose dependent. Hi hypertonic saline, I wouldn't advise this. I think some people use it for that, but um, the other nebulizers work much better. And this is very durable also, and it can be boiled, and it, it lasts for a year. This is the eFlow nebulizer, also called the Altero, and it's made for use with casein, the antibiotic. It's not really a nebulizer, I guess I called it one, but it, it's kind of a screen that sifts medication through it to make a mist. And it has a very different feeling and taste than a nebulizer because it's not moist and wet. It's more of a very soft, floaty mist. So some patients have a lot of trouble with that because it feels very funny when they breathe it in. It's very fast. It's very efficient. It's difficult to clean. Um, the part here is the nebulizer head, this part here, and it attaches to this part which has the batteries in it. So it doesn't need any electricity. It's very quiet. So it has a lot of benefits, but you have to have enough of these heads, which is the expensive part, 
to use for different medications and to have enough available so you can clean them. We're going to talk about cleaning. And the aerosol, I, the aerosol heads tend to get plugged very easily and they have to be changed about every 90 days. And because they're so expensive, it's often very difficult to get the insurance to cover those. So it can be a problem. Any questions about this? Yeah, I, um, sorry. Um, Oh, let me just think about this. I thought this uh, nebulizer was used for some specific uh, medicines, not for all of these. So, Well, let me explain because there's different types. So the eFlow Rapid and the Altera look very similar. The only difference is inside this, sorry, I used the wrong thing, inside here, is the screen that makes the medicine into a mist. And that's different. So on the side of it here, this says eFlow. On the Altera, here it says Altera. And then there's another one floating around called a Trio. So they all have a different screen. So I think that's really confusing. And I know it's confusing because even the nurses in our clinic have a hard time with it. It's very hard to keep straight which is which and what you can use for what. So I've kind of not used it a lot because it's very expensive. It's about $1,200 for just what you see on the screen. And each little handset is about $120. So it's extremely expensive and the insurance doesn't care to pay that when it really is just more convenient. They, they don't consider that a savings. It is effective. It's probably a little more effective, but not so much that it, it's uh, correct. Yeah, that, that's basically what I was going to ask. Um, we had tried something maybe. So I used the Altera nebulizer for Kasten once, thankfully, not since. Um, and we used something called the Aeroneb. Um, friends in other countries recommended this because it has, I think it's similar, it's like a mesh technology, mm -hmm. um, just for uh, saline, but our concern was cleaning. But the idea was that with these smaller particle sizes that it was ideally meant, I mean, the, the theory was that it was meant to be better. Um, so I guess my question is, yeah, do we, do we know this versus kind of the PARI? If well, a they difference. all have measurable sizes of particles, and there is a special particle size that is easily respirable, res breathable, um, and the PARI LC Plus fits that criteria, and the other nebulizers are pretty close, but the cheaper ones are definitely less close, but the particles still get to where they're supposed to go. But this probably has the best size particle, but it's not worth it enough to pay the price and the inconvenience of some of the cleaning characteristics, in my opinion. But that's why everyone has an opinion. On that note, do you, sorry, just do you, have you heard anything about the Aeroneb? Have, has uh, anybody? I've heard that it breaks down a lot. Okay, now, so you don't have like firsthand experience with it. I've or, had a few patients use it, okay. but not on the pediatric side, mostly the adults. Okay. okay. Just curious. We use a lot in the hospital. I was afraid of cleaning it because I think you can't. Oil. I'm trying to remember. To it's been a year it. and a half, yeah. and it's somewhere in my house. But um, yeah, you, it was hard to clean, which enough gave me enough of a reason to not want to use it. <laughs> we use a form of the Aeroneb in the hospital, and it, it's a professional type, and it's excellent. But they don't make it for home use. So, so my question is: uh, so this using this revolutionized uh, our household because it's so fast. And um, I'm wondering if there's any studies that show that compliance is better when you can do a treatment in five minutes versus 40. I don't know if they've had studies showing that, but I can definitely tell you every little bit helps. Yeah. So that's one reason. Um, and just if I could make a comment about the cleaning, uh, there's an engineer who works in our lab, and he uses this for his children. And uh, because he's an engineer, he said, and what's with this cleaning? So he has a, uh, an ultrasonic uh, 
an ultrasonic cleaner will do it. You can buy them for $1,000 for the lab or for $20 if, uh, where they're sold for cleaning jewelry. So they vibrate and they clean these very nicely. That, when I say clean, that's not sterilizing it, but it's just take, getting rid of the plugging that can occur. So, and the final thing on the cost, uh, they're free in Spain, just if anybody <laughs> cares. And they have great wine. <laughs> um, we have one question in the back, and then um, we have to have uh, Kristen continue. Sorry, I just wanted to make a few uh, more specific. Uh, this is not a plug for the pharmacy whatsoever, but the um, the trio, um, which is one that um, isn't often talked about, uh, has been around for 11 years, and it's kind of the original eFlow. Um, the eRapid, um, that is the newest one, the one that's most um, talked about because with the trio, it is so efficient that you have to basically reconstitute the medication, otherwise you will basically overdose. Um, so the E-Rapid was made so that it's a little less efficient, so you don't have to do anything with the drug, but it's still as fast and um, you still get all the medication you need. Um, and the Altera, unfortunately, it's the exact same thing as the trio, um, but it, and it looks exactly the same, um, but it uh, is only made for Kasten. So that's, and they're all a shade of blue. So unfortunately, and uh, the E-Rapid is $860 um, and some insurances are covering it, but not a lot, unfortunately. Okay, so if you don't mind. You know where I work. <laughs> It's not about you. It's about oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> not about you. I just had one comment, which is um, there was a study uh, in Ireland comparing uh, not the not the uh, eFlow, but the Toby Podhaler to uh, the conventional NEB, uh, and it was it did improve adherence in that study, which I forget how long it was, but it was reasonable, and they did show an advantage, which is the selling point uh, to begin with, but they validated that. So interestingly enough, in the pediatric population, the Toby Podhaler has not been very popular. A few of the pediatric patients have tried it and they just don't like it. In fact, they're willing to go back to doing the Toby in the inhaled fashion that takes three times or four times as long to avoid using the Podhaler. So that was very surprising to me. Can you describe the Podhaler? The Podhaler is, is a powdered form of tobramycin, so you have a, a little tablet, a pill capsule that goes into this device and the capsule is, is pierced and then you inhale and as you inhale the capsule spins and you get the medication with your breath. So you can finish it in three to seven breaths. <laughs> okay, I have to go on now. <laughs> This is how you nebulize to an infant. Uh, the mask works very well, and putting the tube in the baby's mouth is probably better than what I see a lot of families doing, which is, and not CF families, I, I hope they're trying better, but a lot of families blow the mist into the patient's, to, to the child's face, and that's really inefficient. And you're paying a lot, of a lot of money for these medications, and you shouldn't be wasting them like this. Um, it's very difficult to get a child used to wearing a mask, but it is not impossible. I've seen a lot of kids get very good at it, so I, I want you to keep at it and call me for some tips. I have a great video on it. This is how you nebulize to a child. You can use a mask. As they get older and uh, they're better at it, it's better to use a mouthpiece because when you use a mask about probably 85% of the medication doesn't make it into the lungs because like Dr. Moss and Dr. Wine said, the nose is made to filter things out. So if you have a mask on and you're not paying attention to what you're doing, a lot of the medication is being filtered through your nose and not going into your lungs where it can work. But you know, everything has to work for a family and some kids, you can just not get them to cooperate with using a mouthpiece for doing their nebs and they do a crummy job at it or it's hanging out of their mouth or the parents don't have the time to sit with them and supervise them so a mask works better in that situation but a mouthpiece definitely works best. 
So special considerations about the medications. It's important not to mix medications in the same nebulizer if you, if you don't know if they mix well together, and sometimes they don't. So it's important to know that. Uh, some of the medications have special storage properties, like they need to be refrigerated, like Toby and, and Pulmazyme. And uh, mucomis, once you open it up, it's only good for about four days before it has to be tossed. And th I think a lot of those little small details get missed by parents because they're hearing so much information when they're being introduced to the drugs that they don't hear this information. So it's important to read the instructions that come in the box at least once when you start a medication. And then the other thing is that medications that we give for inhalation have side effects. Um, hypertonic saline can cause wheezing or bronchospasm that's very irritating. I've seen some kids cough so hard that they throw up and that really isn't what we're trying to achieve. We want them to cough, but we don't want them to lose their lunch. Um, sometimes Toby and Pulmazyme both can cause hoarseness or voice changes. In some patients that's temporary, in some patients it's pretty permanent. And um, some patients definitely complain of a sore throat when they're inhaling antibiotics. Um, a lot of times there's little tricks that I learn from parents. So I encourage parents to talk to other parents about what works well to help their children to tolerate these things because they're really important medications. So airway clearance, that's kind of a can of worms. We're going to talk about the different types. Chest physiotherapy is pretty much the gold standard of what we've been doing for the last 40 years. It is uh, physically cupping your hands or using little cups to percuss the body, kind of like you would with a ketchup bottle when you want the ketchup to flow. You, it's how you get the mucus out. And at the same time, you position the body into different positions. The vest is something that we use a lot in our center. Um, you put the, the device on. I'm going to show you pictures in a little while, so I'm not going to describe it too much. I just want to say that it's pretty foolproof because it doesn't require the child to be particularly still or compliant. <laughs> so it works well. That's why we like to use it a lot. Vibratory, expiratory PEP is a way of having a device that you exhale into that vibrates and creates kind of a back pressure in, in the airways to help get mucus out. Positive expiratory is very similar, but it doesn't include the vibration part. And then huffing and the huff cough and coughing are very important parts of airway clearance that I think a lot, a lot of times people don't think about. And, um, you almost have to teach kids how to cough. Sounds crazy, but it's true. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So this, these are showing pictures of chest physiotherapy on a baby. Uh, this is what I teach families to do when their children are newly diagnosed. Um, we used to tip children so that their heads were lower than their hips and we don't really do that anymore because it seemed to cause a lot of gastroesophageal reflux. So this is the basic chest physiotherapy that's been around for a very long time and uh, this child is being very cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times a lot of times as the kids get older and less cooperative it's definitely a very difficult um, prospect. These are examples of the vests that are available on the market. I think there's probably five or six different types. I got the four most common ones on here. Uh, the Aflo vest in the lower right hand corner is the newest uh, on the market. It is battery operated. We have not prescribed it for any of our patients because they have not done any studies that have shown us that it's effective. And uh, so, you know, a lot of people are very interested in it because you don't need electricity for it. But until we can see some evidence that it actually works comparably to the other devices, we're not going to be prescribing it. So, oh, that 
slide didn't come out, but um, I think pictures speak a thousand words. A vest doesn't work very well when you're laying on the ground smashing it and the mask is on your forehead. <laughs> but it is really common for kids to get very sleepy when they're using the vest. So I understand when they fall asleep. I can understand that. But do try to practice great technique. Get the kids sitting up, participating, breathing with the mask or holding the mouthpiece in their mouth. It, it work, makes a world of difference. These are some examples of vibratory positive expiratory pressure. And the aero, aerobica up in, here in the corner is one of the newer ones that I like a lot. It's very easy to clean and it can be sterilized. This is it attached to a nebulizer and this is the band nebulizer that uh, is, <coughs> operates on inhalation only. Another nebulizer that we use but it has not been okayed for use with antibiotics. This is uh, a series of acapella devices. I bet nobody knew that there were four of them. This clear one is designed to be used with a, a nebulizer in line. The other ones you can do that but you probably shouldn't because they found that when you use a nebulizer in line with the acapella a lot of the medication is uh, destroyed inside the acapella so it doesn't make it into the lungs. So, of these, this one is easy to wash, and these two lower ones are easy to wash. These are washable, but it's very difficult. This one is pretty much obsolete. The flutter, I just don't see very much anymore. I know that they still have them a lot in Europe and Canada. Any questions about these? Yes. Okay. Well, Kristen, where can I, how do I get that clear one, Archipelago? I didn't know about that one. That it can it's in. manufactured by Monaghan. I think Monaghan like the others, so you just have to... Their website, yeah. Usually all I can see is the blue and the green. And the blue. It's called the Duet. It's called what? Duet. Duet. Thank you. Goes with acapella. <laughs> Do you want me to sing? <laughs> no, you don't want me to sing. These are... And, oh, I'm sorry. No, you mentioned... I have five minutes left. Great. Um, you mentioned age. At what age can you start using those? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. You have to be old enough to cooperate with it and to pay attention to what you're doing. So if you have really with it children, they could probably do it at age six or seven, but generally not till adolescence. But it, you still need to, the parents still need to stand by and watch what's going on because we all know what our children do <laughs> when we're not looking. So one of my favorite things to tell families is don't, don't shove your kids away in their room and ask them to do their airway clearance. It needs to be something that's done in, with the family. It should be a family affair because it's horrible. It's not fun to do. So you need to include it with family activities and try and make it fun. And that's a big challenge. Okay, we're gonna save the questions for the end, I'm sorry. This is positive expiratory pressure. It's the um, airway clearance without the vibration. Very common in Europe and Canada, very effective, but again, it has to be done efficiently. And I have to say that in California, a lot of patients like immediate response to the treatments that they do, and it's very hard to tell with this if you're doing it properly. It's hard to do it properly and it's, um, it just doesn't give a lot of feedback, so I don't find that patients use it very well in California especially. But it is available. I have all of this in the clinic, and I'm always happy to show people how to do different things. So huffing. The huff cough is a way of coughing where you uh, blast air out of your lungs without closing your glottis. So the difference is this versus this. And closing your glottis creates about a lot of back pressure, whereas the huffing tends to help the airway stay open so that the mucus can flow out. And it's a great way to get started with the coughing because it really helps to get the secretions moving. And a lot of times kids will say, I can't get anything out, and they'll cough once for me. 
So I teach them how to do the huffing. I especially like to do this when they're in to give a sputum sample because it really helps to get the sputum out for them to cough it into a cup. The younger kids, probably under the age of eight, are not able to do this so well, but it, it is never too young to try to start teaching your kids to do it. So you keep repeating it until the mucus is in a place where you can easily cough it up. So the cough is, is very explosive. The huffing is, is more calm. A violent cough can actually uh, cause your airways to collapse and it traps the mucus. So a lot of times when people are coughing violently and, and hard, nothing's moving because they're just, you know, they're closing their throat and they're forcing the air out, but the air gets trapped the mucus is trapped and it, it makes it very difficult to remove secretions. So if you start with the huffing before you do the coughing, you'll get a lot farther. One of the things I want to talk a little bit about is cough suppression. Um, I've seen a lot of kids come into the clinic that obviously are very, are ill, they have a lot of secretions, but they're holding back on their cough, and it, they do this for a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is because every time they cough, their mom goes, oh, that's so gross, that's disgusting. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> so, it goes back to being a good role model for our children. We have to encourage them to do these things. and. And it's really important in CF, it's, it's their life. They have to get that mucus out of their lungs. So one of the other things that I think a lot of times happens with kids is when they start to cough more, their parents think they're sick. And their parents get very uh, worried about them. So the kids suppress their cough because they don't want their parents to worry. And so there has to be a really fine line between encouraging your kids to cough, but also noting when their cough is increasing when they can't control it so much. So you don't want to discourage them from coughing, but you also don't want to make a big deal about it. Last, we move on to exercise, and I hope everybody exercises. We all need to exercise. When we have CF, it's really important to exercise. And I've heard kids say they're too sick to exercise, and that's just not true. Um, my good friend Julie with CF says, if you can breathe, you can exercise, and that's absolutely true. You can do some degree of exercise, and it's excellent for your airway clearance. It's necessary, and it's important for the whole family. So if you can't get your kids to exercise, then you're gonna have to do it as a family activity, which, you know, it's gonna, it's hard to fit it in, but it's important. It's good for the kids to do things with their families. So if you can't get them to do the stuff on their own, they don't see you exercising, again, you have to be a good role model for your children and exercise with them. Is there a good exercise that's better than any others? No. But something aerobic that makes you breathe hard and cough up mucus and uh, keeps you healthy is the way to go. So if you can listen to what we talked about today, learn how to manage your child's breathing treatments and um, make it a routine for your family, you can help to maintain the best lung function possible for your children. You can reduce the number of respiratory infections that they get. And you can learn to balance the CF care with your family's quality of life. Do I have time to talk about equipment cleaning? I better talk about equipment cleaning. It's important to keep your equipment clean and disinfected. And these are the steps. You wash your hands first. You disassemble the equipment. Can you see on here that there's a little blue flap that also is removed from this part that is removed from this part? And they all have to be taken apart to clean because they all trap uh, moisture. Moisture is the um, enemy here. Whenever there's moisture, bacteria likes it. So whenever you wash equipment, it's important to dry it before you use it again. 
And one of the important things about drying the equipment is it should air dry. You don't want to wipe it off with a paper towel and say it's dry because there's little nooks and crannies where the um, moisture hides. And then you're getting it moist again with the nebulized medication. So you're just going to perpetuate the moisture problem. So you need to give yourself enough time and enough equipment so that you can wash it, hopefully sterilize it and dry it before you have to use it again. A dishwasher works well too without the dog inside. <laughs> My dog licks from the outside luckily. But. And a baby bottle sterilizer is a great way to sterilize equipment, but it's an expensive way to do it. And I wouldn't run out to buy one of those when you can boil water on the stove. Just be sure you set the timer because I've had a lot of families <laughs> melt their equipment. <laughs> The compressor needs a filter change every six months. The compressors are guaranteed to work for five years. So if yours breaks down before that, which I can pretty much guarantee it's going to, it should be replaced by the manufacturer, not the home care company. They're not helpful about this. So the manufacturer of this is PARI. And we use a lot of PARI products because they're, they're made well. This compressor is not an example of one of those. But the PARI Pro is made especially for CF patients because it's made to be more durable and work longer. But there's a big, you know, when you put a nebulizer on there and there's medication, there's a lot of back pressure that it has to push through and it's just not made to last for very long. So it's always good to have one, an extra one on hand. And when you have problems, you're, you can call me and I'll help you get a new one. It's a little time consuming though, so I always encourage people to have an extra one. And you can purchase them online, they're not that expensive, so I would encourage that. Uh, when you're away from home, Medela makes microwavable bags that you can use to disinfect equipment in a microwave. And uh, those aren't really CF foundation approved, but it's it's a workable way of doing it. You can also use a bowl with water and boil in the microwave for five minutes. Um, if you don't want to take your vest with you, the aerobica and the other um, vibratory PEP or PEP devices are, are good for using on vacation as long as you pay attention to what you're doing. And exercise is something you can do everywhere. Thank you. I know we've had a lot of questions, but uh, just to keep on schedule out of respect for our following uh, presenters, if we can keep going, Kristen, are you staying through to the end? Because if you have questions, could people ask you at the very of course, end? Of Wonderful. Now we had, we were to have a 15 minute break here. What I would say is if people could do like a dash, mad dash to the restroom, mad dash to grab a snack, and then we will proceed. So we'll only be set back by about five minutes and keep on track. Kristen, thank you so much.